Welcome to our talk on secure release processes with internal policy verification. Uh, my name is Aditya. I'm a PhD student at New York University. I'm a maintainer of the internal framework. I am also a maintainer of a number of other software supply chain security related projects like GitHub and Git Sign, Six or Git Sign, the Salsa specification, and so on. And I've contributed to related efforts like the TUF project and the CNCF uh, tax security uh, s uh, software supply chain security working group. Uh, that. Hi, I'm uh, John, and I'm a, a director of open source at Testify Sec. Uh, in addition to that, I'm a CNCF security tag uh, tech lead and maintainer of Witness in Archivista. We've got these cool t-shirts. Um, and also SBOM it, which is in OpenSSF, which combines Intoto attestations and SBOMs. Uh, and then we just released a new version uh, through Tag Security of uh, the V2 of Supply Chain Security Best Practices. So definitely check that out if you haven't yet. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. Software supply chain attacks. Um, so kind of looking at this, starting out, defining what it is we mean by a, a software supply chain attack. You have, a, or you know, software supply chain. Before we talk about the attack part, a collection of systems, devices, organizations, and people people which produce a final software product. So, as uh, uh, most folks here probably know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a re release of software, and it's more than just ones and zeros. Uh, it's about how it gets there, the people who got it there, uh, the processes with which it went through to get there, the devices, the hardware, the software, all, all of those things. So how do we, what happens, or, or how do we define an attack on this process? Uh, so when one or more weaknesses in the components of the software supply chain are compromised to introduce alterations into the final software product. So you know, basically, whatever you produce at the end is not what you expect. And we've just seen a couple of software supply chain attacks in recent memory. Uh, one of the things that uh, Santiago, uh, who did the keynote this morning, uh, he helps maintain this catalog of uh, supply chain compromises under the CNCF tag security repo. So if you want to go and read about uh, a whole bunch of different software supply chain attacks, this is a good place to check that out. And it's not getting better, right? It's just continually getting worse. And so we can see uh, from this, the, the Sonotype uh, state of supply chain security report, this is the number of malicious packages discovered. Um, just a couple more in 2024 than 2023, which is, you know, it, I can't even tell you how many times more than 2021. So, all right. But the title of the talk didn't say anything about supply chain attacks. And one thing we, we have learned is data breaches don't matter, right? So this is a chart of the stock price of companies within six months after they've suffered a major data breach. And it's adjusted relative to uh, the overall stock market, but they all go up. They've all made more money six months after a data breach than they did before. And so there's not a whole lot of incentive to do security the right way if there's no financial impact. So, you know, that's data breaches. Are supply, ch is su supply chain attacks any different? Uh, if you look at the executive order that came out, uh, I, some people definitely do think uh, it's important. If you think about critical infrastructure uh, within any government or country, or if you think of uh, medical devices, things that control life and death. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to actually care about supply chain security. And you know, the other part of this is you know, people caring about that turns into compliance. And we all love our, our favorite NIST publications. Um, this is after that executive order, um, SSDF, the Secure Software Development Framework, and uh, more recently, the uh, NIST 800-204-D. Uh, each of these are publications that started out as just publications. And eventually, over time, as different organizations start updating and implementing their own versions of policies for either your own internal release 
release process or other things, then these become referenced. They become the way in which it's recommended to do things or oftentimes required to do things. So uh, the example of uh, NIST 800-204-D, it was just referenced in the most recent version of um, the DOD's DevSecOps strategies. So, you know, these are going to help change be things because you don't have a choice. If you want to sell to these types of customers, you have to comply with these, uh, these things. So if we have to do it anyways, can we do it to make a more secure product? That's the intent, right? Like these things, even though they seem burdensome, they seem terrible, they are supposed to help make software more secure. And so can we do that? Um, there's also uh, increasing prevalence of continuous being added to all of these types of compliance, whether it's continuous ATO, authority to operate, or continuous monitoring is a part of the m most recent version of FedRAMP. Uh, you have to produce a report every 30 days that you're still in compliance with your original audit. That's a lot if you're doing everything manually every single time with PDFs that are hundreds of pages long, or Excel spreadsheets that, uh, or Word documents that can't be exported to PDF because they're so large. Um, there's a lot of scary things that can go on there. Um, but we can, perhaps, uh, make this more, more secure if we do it the right way. We can increase developer velocity by providing them faster feedback in the right places, not blocking their development processes, but helping provide them feedback that they're not in compliance while they're developing, and then only block things or only restrict things when they try to ship software to customers or deploy it on production infrastructure. And if we automate all of that, we can do it all the time. So, um, you know, this is an example software factory here. Uh, this is from that uh, DOD guidance on DevSecOps, uh, and it just shows uh, uh, an example pipeline, starting with your source code repository, building something, uh, a binary, testing it with a static analysis tool, doing some unit tests, building a container image, scanning uh, that for uh, vulnerabilities, generating an SBOM, uh, and then eventually delivering that, putting it in a container registry to deploy it or shipping it to a customer. So this is a process that can help with that developer workflow, right? Having them, if you have a bunch of developers using the same standardized process, it can help ensure that they're, they're in compliance. But it doesn't do everything. And so um, one of the things that we should do is observe all of these, those processes, right? If the developer is able to modify that pipeline, or if they're able to, if you're, even if you have that pipeline, but your release process is a confluence page where the developers go and paste screenshots of their unit test passing, then it doesn't really matter that you have this great software factory, right? And so we should be gathering evidence about all of these things. We should be observing the processes themselves and formatting that information in a specific way so that it can be understood later on. And then once we do that, we store all that evidence, how are you gonna find it? You need to understand what evidence relates to uh, each other and also uh, when's the right time to use it. And so this is where Intoto comes in. This is a maintainer track talk, believe it or not. Um, and we have the Intoto specification. It's a standard way to sign attestations and uh, distribute them by the, in this format. And there's different types. Uh, and we'll go into the details of some of these things more. Here you can see um, you know, information about a Git repository or testing, building, uh, and distributing. So here, if you, if you really want to get down to the JSON, you can see um, the, the envelope on the outside, uh, which is signed. And there's a whole variety of mechanisms you can use for signing. Uh, and then the payload inside is where the more interesting things happen. Uh, it always should be an Intoto statement in this case. And then when you get into the blue section down here about the predicate type, that's where all the really useful information is. And we'll show how to use that. The other part that's important is uh, the bottom right here, the example subject. So every time uh, an attestation is created, something is a, it, it's 
talking about something, right? So if you're observing a unit testing process, the subject of it should be that unit testing process or the git commit of the version of code that went into that process or if it's a build, the artifact that's an output of that process. So um, here, this is the WITI, our, our logo for uh, Witness, and uh, it's kind of the, the newest version implementation of uh, intro to attestations. Uh, with disclaimer, my uh, company originally developed this, but we donated it to the Intoto project. It's officially a part of uh, the CNCF. And the main reason for that is because we want everyone to use it. Like, hopefully all of you uh, will go out and create attestations. And, it's built on this standard, so you can go and use that standard however you want to afterwards. So one of the things that Witness does differently is this idea of a tester. So previously, uh, with some of the other implementations of Intoto, it was fairly monolithic. You had the idea of a link attestation, which would just observe a process and put all of the information in you know, one uh, fairly large, potentially large uh, Intoto statement. With Witness, we're able to have different points in time during the observation where we perform different things. So before a process starts, we can gather information from the .git directory or look at a JOT token from a, a GitHub uh, pipeline or a GitLab pipeline and be able to, to get this information. Go all the way down to the hardware level if you want to with a TPM. And then we're always going to capture the inputs as materials and the outputs as products, uh, and then the information about the process itself. And then after this is generated, being able to sign it uh, with a whole variety of key providers and store it, and in this case, in ArcVista. Um, and so you know, not only does this store those attestations, it indexes and graphs the relationships between all those subjects as they're stored. So this allows us to later on, when we want to do cool things with policy and other stuff to query, all the way from the end, here's our final artifact, and trace that back to the code commit at the very beginning that to ensure all those steps were done against the right things. And so here's a high level overview of kind of this process, continuous monitoring from the code repositories on the left all the way over to policy creation, um, creating that, storing it in Archivista. But this is another huge benefit of this being open source. This entire ecosystem of integrations along the bottom here, they were not all built by one company or the project. We've had people who are casual users of uh, Witness show up and it was easy enough to implement a Jenkins attester or a Vex attester or different things like this uh, that all really come together from the community that make it better. So we have all of this evidence, we, right, we, we've increased the transparency of our supply chain, we know what's happening in there, and that's where we get to do really fun stuff, like actually validate that, you know, what's happening in our supply chain meets expectations, right? We want to look at every step in the supply chain, like the, the software factory that John showed a few minutes ago, right, from source to build to testing to generating S-bombs to, you know, scans. And, all of that stuff. We want to set expectations for what happened in each of those steps, as well as what happened overall. Like in the context of, hey, was my build performed in the right CI system? Was was my the artifact that we actually built was it actually tested and scanned? Did we produce an S bomb at the right time? Because you know you want to know that you can like. The value of an S bomb is that you've got to know that it was produced at the right time with the right contents, right? You've got to be able to trust the S bomb as well. So that's that's that, those are the kind of things we're talking about when we talk about validating the development processes. And uh, one thing that that kind of like is core to the point of Intoto is that stepwise checks aren't enough. Like you may have all kinds of best practices in each individual step in your supply chain, right? Hey, we have two-party code review for every commit that you know gets merged into our main branch. And you know, we sign all our commits. All, all of that is great. And and hey, maybe we do reproducible builds, right? Um, we, we have deterministic builds, we have two separate isolated build systems, and you know, and everything we build gets built in both of them and we compare the results at the end. Great. So that might secure the build system itself. And maybe using things like 
Duff, which is you know, another CNCF project, and PLS to securely distribute uh, your artifacts. But we, we've got to look at the supply chain holistically, right? we, because we want to know that, yes, maybe we followed all the best practices for our code writing step, the source step, but, and, and maybe we followed all the best practices for the build step, but was the thing that got reviewed and the, the commit that got signed, was that actually the thing that got built in the build step, right? Like, we've got to be able to connect the dots all the way back, as uh, John was talking about a few minutes ago. And, and that's where Intoto's notions of setting expectations comes in. Um, so first off, who here knew of Intoto before this KubeCon or you know, has, has been familiar with this project for a while? Okay. And who here has been aware of this project out, you know, like outside of the context of the attestation framework and Salsa and all of that stuff? Anyone? OK, cool, some hands, fewer hands. Uh, so this is something, this, this comes up surprisingly often when we're talking about Intoto in that like, we, like the project kind of blew up in like after SolarWinds and after Salsa became a thing and all of that. And, and like people started using the attestation framework in all kinds of cool ways. But Intoto predates that by several years. And there's a whole one point of spec that, that kind of predates the attestation framework and all of that stuff. And, and the reason I bring this up is from day one, like from that one point of spec, we've had this notion of policies that, that are called layouts in that version of the spec that, that were very focused on this kind of comprehensive verification of what's happening in our supply chain. So what you see here in this graphic, for example, is that, hey, uh, we have some you know, source code writing step that's performed by Bob with Carol performing a build. We've got Dave running some tests separately. And we've got Ed and packaging everything up and sending it out of the door. But uh, the whole point of what Intoto does on the side, I don't know if you can like, really see, is set expectations on what is of the artifacts as they move from one step to the next. Like, the, the policy here is really trying to ensure, like, with, which we, we're showing with the arrows here, right, is that what Carol built was, like, the source that Carol built was, in fact, the source that Bob produced, right? We don't want those gaps in the supply chain where an attacker can get in and kind of feed your build system the wrong revision to build and things like that. And this, is, this, this fundamental idea has been carried over to the work that we've been doing uh, for what has kind of generalized rather than you know, continue to call it layouts, which also tends to be a little confusing, uh, more generalized as in total policies, right, for version two of the spec and beyond. Like the first, like the first thing is we want to continue that holistic, you know, across all steps uh, verification properties of Intoto and also support the attestation framework and kind of leverage the rich information that attestations give us. Because uh, as, we, as, 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 as was mentioned a few minutes ago, um, like before the attestation framework was a thing, Intoto captured metadata for your steps in the supply chain, but it was more generic, right? There, was, there, wasn't, there weren't all of these kind of rich types. There was, it didn't distinguish between, hey, this is build provenance, and hey, this is a vulnerability scan report, and this is an SBOM. It didn't, it, it didn't, you didn't have these notions of what your information really was from all of these different steps and all of these different tools, which meant that you couldn't really cleanly set expectations based on the kind of data you were dealing with for a particular step in your supply chain. And with that, I'm going to actually hand it off back to John for a quick demo of some of all of this stuff. All right. So uh, just to kind of tell you about the demo before we dive into it, so hopefully it makes a little more sense. Um, this is a GitHub Actions pipeline. There's an open source repository um, that we'll have the link for that you can go and see all this. So all the actions runs and everything else, the logs, you can go and look at it and see whether or not this is really happening. Um, but there's a, you know, a whole series of steps here, uh, formatting code, vetting code, linting code. That step is looking for certain uh, characteristics of documents Docker files, and then unit testing, static analysis, building a container image, and then generating an SBOM and scanning that container for secrets. So we've got a whole long process here. Uh, what we're going to see is a developer who decides they really need to run their container as root for whatever reason. And so that's going to happen in the linting step, and we'll see what happens during the demo. And then the next part is going to be someone trying to tamper with the input to the build image itself. So we'll go ahead and switch over here. 
And uh, so here you can see the, the modification to the pipeline of basically, I'm going to add in that I want to be the user root in this container, and I'm going to ignore DL3002, which just so happens to be the rule of the static an uh, analyzer that's checking to see if you're running as root in the container. Uh, so that's not really OK with us. Um, but if we look at the pipeline run here, uh, everything is green. Everything passes. And so we'll go ahead and go here uh, to the to the CLI, and I resize my screen so everything uh, is back. But uh, what we can do is look at, make sure these run numbers match up. I think that should be good. And we'll go ahead and verify this. And so we're providing it with a layout. We're providing it with that URL of the pip pipeline run. And this is how we're able to go and collect all of the evidence. So you can see here, we're going out to Archivista, and we're finding evidence for the format step, and the vetting step, and the linting step, all the different steps that were laid out there. And at the very end here, we can see that our verification failed because we were expecting that that command didn't have an ignore rule in there. So that's good. Uh, we were able to stop the developer from doing this thing, but we didn't disrupt their normal workflow, right? This happened later on when we ran the policy verification. And that could be as a, you know, a gating thing that blocks deploying to production, or it could be completely separate from that and provide feedback to the developer uh, at the end of the pipeline or somewhere else. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead all right, we don't want to run as root. We're going to go ahead and, and remove that ignore rule, and we're going to uh, remove uh, being able to use uh, user as root. But I'm just going to, you know, maybe somebody won't see this in my code review. I'm just going to maybe put in a little sed command here and put that right back in. But I'm going to do that during the build step, not during the linting step. It's going to happen afterwards. So once again here, we can go to the next pipeline run for this commit and see that um, you know, there is all green jobs, once again. And so we can go back and run this verification against that pipeline. We go out, we collect all the evidence, and in this case, we can see here our Git attestation failed the verification. And this says because the attestation has a status. And so inside the schema for the git attestation, the status is essentially, if on the CLI you, you get status, what's changed? So in this case, there was results because things changed on disk that were not committed to the code repository. So we were able to see that and once again uh, fail the policy. So. We will we'll give up at this point, go ahead and, and remove this, fix everything, another run, all green, and hopefully this time, as we run this, we should get all the way to the end and see our verification was actually successful. Um, so this is what the policy looks like for all of this. Uh, you can see here we laid out the linting step. Um, we're expecting this to be inside of an attestation collection. And the functionary is the person we expect to perform this operation. So it could be the, the private signing key. It could be SIGStore using full CO or something else like that. It could be a key management system. Um, and we're expecting all this type of information. This is how we're checking to make sure that there's no source code modified on disk. And here we're providing a rule to check that command itself. And so uh, this is kind of the, the way in which you can build out this policy to help look for these things and, and make sure that the expectations you have actually align with what's really happening. Cool. Uh, so how did we get here, right? I talked about total layouts in V1, and I talked about, hey, we've been working on some cool updates to support the attestation framework and all of that. And um, Dodo is a community-driven driven project, and uh, we've kind of got all of these projects as, that are part of the Intoto umbrella, including Witness, Archivista, and so on. And one of the other things we have is a relatively new dedicated policies working group. Um, it's been kind of leading the evolution of Intoto layouts into something closer to what you saw in the demo just now, right, with, with the notion of what attestations are and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, 
uh, it's currently composed of you know people who are adopters of Intoto, who are ma maintainers of Intoto, and are trying to solve a number of problems with like making Intoto policies, uh, you know, stabilize the spec and so on. So Intoto itself is fundamentally a, a specification, right? We have implementations of it, but it's fundamentally a specification. So changes like uh, what I'm what we're talking about here with the policies and so on are proposed as what's known as in total enhancements. They're, you can think of them, they we call them ITs. We, you can, they're similar to you know, PEP in the Python world and uh, so on. Um, so there were two ITs that really kind of extended layouts to support attestations. Uh, and, and a big part of what the policies working group is working on is uh, stabilizing the ITs so that we kind of have a more steady specification that people can build off of. Uh, we also prototyped all of this in attestation verifier, which also is what you saw in the witness demo just now. We just kind of wired it into witness uh, as, as something optional to just play with. Uh, but yeah, so the working group is focusing on, in addition to kind of like as a first step to stabilizing these ITs, uh, we're, there, we're focusing on things like how do we make writing and managing all of these policies easier, right? Maybe we want something like, hey, uh, we want to create like higher level policies that are easier to write for developers, right? They, they don't want to mess with like to the level of granularity that you saw in the example policy from the demo, right? Uh, so how do we enable those kinds of things so that in a large enterprise you can actually have people in different parts of the company kind of self-manage locally what, because they know their portion of their supply chains, like their local supply chains better than something that can be managed centrally, right? So uh, how do we make writing these kinds of policies easier? Um, and again, I want to kind of emphasize that uh, when I'm talking about policies, we keep going back to that notion of the holistic across all steps idea. And uh, we also want to enable like reusability. Hey, how do we make, you know, small templates that you can kind of put it into like, hey, uh, maybe a build process, the expectations for a build process don't really change so much depending on which team or org you're in in a big company. And you kind of just want to like fill in the blanks rather than write the entire block for your build step from scratch, right? Uh, so reusability, high level policies, reuse of use and things like that. and. One of the things we're focused on is we don't want to create yet another way to do policies, right? We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, we're trying to bring the core and total ideas of holistic supply chain verification to, and, and we hope to integrate with like other efforts in the space. Uh, we've seen folks from Enterprise Contract Shop. Uh, we've seen folks from Macaron uh, show up to our policies working group. We, like, you know, we, we're all trying to solve this same fundamental problem of supply chain security uh, and verifiability in what's happening in our software development processes. So we're trying to like integrate better uh, with all of these disparate efforts because, uh, yeah, for, for example, in the last meeting we saw you know, we, we, also, we, we saw how Macron can accomplish some of the checks that Intoto does. And I, what I'm really excited to see in the next one, based on what we saw in the last meeting, is uh, tighter integration and uh, uh, with, with like the you know multi-step checks that 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 are fundamental to the Intoto policy idea. Um, I'm also going to talk about some community updates. Uh, we've had a lot of really cool integrations and adoptions. We always close out our maintainer track talk with this. And I want to add a few things to this slide. Uh, like this, this already has, you know, other CNCF projects, enterprises, open source projects, you know, really cool stuff. Um, but earlier this year, GitHub announced uh, artifact attestations, right? Uh, it was already possible to use in total with GitHub, but now it's kind of more of a first class citizen. And while it says public beta, I think it's now in GA. Yeah, I'm fairly certain it's now in GA. So this is just a blog post from, I think, late April or early May. Um, and we've seen kind of uh, how this has been picked up by other efforts to generate internal attestations for their uh, software supply chains. Uh, we saw this with Homebrew, um, where they started generating, because they control the builds for all Homebrew bottles, right? Uh, on GitHub Actions, they were able to leverage this to start producing attestations, which can be verified by the Homebrew package manager when you're installing a package from Homebrew. 
uh, I think just yesterday, PyPI announced that they now support signed digital attestations. Just now? Oh, OK, cool. Um, so it, I, I hear it was literally today, two hours ago. Um, I don't know how I saw it yesterday. Uh, so uh, PyPI announced that they support digital attestations um, based off of PEP 740. Uh, that's also using internal under the hood, right? Um, so that's really cool. And uh, they, they joined NPM, which did something similar, I think, about a year and a half ago. So it's really cool to see all of these packaging ecosystems uh, start producing attestations for, you know, uh, well, the packages that are uh, getting su submitted to those registries. Um, and I don't know if any of you saw this on the schedule. We're already in that talk, but I want to call out there was a really neat talk from some folks at uh, Adobe and Autodesk um, that talked about how they're using, you know, witness to uh, secure their supply chain to produce attestations and so on and so forth. There's also a one pager that kind of gives a high level overview of what's happening there. Uh, and I believe a more detailed case studies coming to the CNCF blog in the near future. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, with that, yeah. So we could update this uh, with, you know, PyPI, Adobe, Autodesk, Homebrew. We're kind of getting tight on space, but you know we'll figure something out. Uh, as as but it's 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 been really incredible to kind of see all of this fill out. So yeah, uh, and total's also up for graduation in the CNCF. Um, I think we're getting close. I hope we're getting close. So um, also keep keep your eyes out for that. Come come show support when that happens. Um, and finally, come join us. We even if I say so myself, we're a very welcoming community. We meet. We have like a full Intoto community meeting once a month, the first Friday of every month, but we also have dedicated meetings for the attestations project and the policies working group and witness and archivista and so on. So come say hello. We're on the CNCF Slack. Um, if, are there any IRC users in the room? <laughs> okay, so we have an IRC channel on the Libra server, uh, but uh, you know, we're, we're gonna stick to it. So, uh, and we also have a mailing list, and everything we do is on GitHub. So, yeah, come say hello. And I think we have about three minutes for questions. All right, so if nobody has questions, how many of you have ever done brew install in the last, like, three months? All right, you've all used Intoto, whether or not you know it. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>